Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Christian Shelton. He's uh, an associate professor at UC Riverside. He got his PhD from MIT and did a postdoc at Stanford before that. He's one of the pioneers in continuous time modeling. Christian Shelton. Thank you. So um, my research is in machine learning and I'm particularly in dynamic systems. So uh, I have an interest in all forms of dynamic systems and for about the past 10 years or so, I've been interested in uh, models of, of continuous time systems, sort of systems that are asynchronous. So let me give you an example of, of some asynchronous uh, stochastic systems. <coughs> um, so phylogenetic trees, so you have genetics and they, um, you know, uh, different species change at different rates over times. Um, social networks, I'll give an example of some uh, social network examples. Um, what I'm going to be spending the next year on um, as a, a, in my sabbatical um, ICU patients. This is a large um, stochastic uh, system that you'd like to, to reason about and control. Um, software verification for a long time has dealt with um, models of, uh, of stochastic systems um, and, and some others. What's interesting about all these systems is that they uh, evolve in naturally in continuous time. Um, there are discrete events that occur in these systems and that the rate of these events can change drastically from component to component in the system and over time. So there's not maybe a constant rate of change in these systems. So um, what I, this talk is organized sort of in three components. The first component is I'm going to try to explain uh, why continuous time is an important modeling tool. So right, computers themselves are naturally discrete time uh, entities, right? There's a clock that runs on your computer. Um, but just like uh, we use uh, real values when we derive our algorithms, despite the fact they're going to be implemented in a computer and essentially on integer arithmetic, um, Treating time as a continuous quantity is important. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. Then I'll talk about some of uh, the work that we've done in, in models of such continuous time systems. And then I'm going to show some examples. So here are some theoretical, uh, and then I'll also some experimental reasons why a continuous time is advantageous. So consider um, the typical discrete time system as a Markov chain. So you have a system that evolves over time. This is sort of a very simple Markov chain. Um, here we have a row stochastic matrix describing that chain. That is, uh, the probability of staying in the first state um, from one time set to the next is 75%. Uh, otherwise, you move to the other state. And if you're in state two, then you, you switch to 50% um, uh, of the time. OK. So that's fine. Um, if So it depends on why you've described the system. But if your, your actual system was in continuous time and evolved, and you just happen to be sampling at this particular rate, and you end up with a matrix like this, we can ask the question of, OK, so what would the stochastic matrix look like uh, if we were interested in in sort of at, at twice the sampling rate, or half the, 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 the window size. So that means that we need basically a, a stochastic square root matrix. So we need a matrix like this. Um, and in this case, that gives us that matrix there. Okay, so that's fine. This describes the same system at, at twice the sampling rate. So good. So now what if my system looks like this? Okay, so I have a system that flips back and forth. We can ask the same question again, and we end up with this matrix. Okay, and I guess if you're in quantum mechanics, it doesn't bother you. But um, uh, for the rest of us, we don't like having uh, imaginary components to our probabilities. <clears throat> okay? um, so there is no Markov system at half the rate that is equivalent to this system at this rate. And it's not a feature that I happen to have zeros in there. If I make them 0.1, it's the same thing happens. Okay, it's just the numbers are more messy. Okay? So, there are a couple ways of viewing this. Uh, one is that the space of discrete time Markov systems is larger than the space of continuous time Markov systems. There are systems that at a discrete time are Markovian, but there is no continuous time that is Markovian. Okay? So, um, so if you're viewing your Markov assumption there um, as a, say, a regularization or a convenience, okay, then maybe this doesn't bother you. But if you believe the reason that I chose this state is that the underlying system is truly Markovian in this state, you may, if using discrete time, go off and estimate a system that actually doesn't correspond to any Markovian continuous time system underneath. Mm -hmm. What troubles me about this is that in real life, like a social network, mm -hmm. I mean, if this situation occurs too often, you just simply reduce the, um, your sampling time. 
Okay, sure. Smaller and smaller, and then you will avoid all these problems. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. So you could. Well, well, yeah. It, presuming that you, you, you. So do you have to know ahead of time how small you need it to be, and then your computational time grows. So I'm going to talk about the computational time and other factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So the other problems I want to uh, represent uh, don't show up in the sort of this flat Markovian system, but show up in a in a in a structured one. So, you know, if you have n states, you need an n by n matrix to describe a discrete time. Uh, Markov system. But it, I usually describe things in terms of uh, states. You describe them in terms of assignments to variables. So if you have, like, say, n binary variables, that means you need a, there are two to the n different assignments to those binary variables. I need two to the n by two to the n matrix. Okay. Um, and so the answer is that I need some compact representation for that because that's not tractable for any reasonable n. Um, you know, decision diagrams have been used in computer science literature. Dynamic Bayesian networks are more common in machine learning and AI. Um, but there's some problems here, and I'm going to focus on DBNs because I think that's more familiar to this audience. So here's the simplest DBN I can have. So I have two processes. Um, process A uh, you know, is a Markov process that doesn't depend on anything else. It goes its merry way. And process B um, depends on A, because if it doesn't depend on A, then I have a really truly simple system. So now let's ask the following problem uh, question. So what happens if I unroll that for another time step? And again, I ask a similar question, which is, um, what if I instead want a DBN to describe the system across two time steps instead of across one? I don't like my sampling rate. I'd like some other sampling rate. So I have this one here, and I marginalize out the two variables in between, and I get this, at least if I want to describe it in terms of a DBN. I get this structure. You notice the structure has changed. I have an extra edge here that didn't show up here before. Okay. What does that mean? Um, it means, in some sense, that this particular structure was not just a function of the underlying process. It was a function of the underlying process and a particular sampling rate. Yep, OK. So put differently. If I have this underlying structure at, at half the sampling rate, and now I ask the question, what structure could I have marginalized to get here? The answer is there are none. Which isn't to say there isn't a DBN. There's a DBN, but its structure doesn't come out like this when you marginalize it. This independence assumption here is hidden inside the, inside of the probability distributions here. It's not, it's not representable as in the graphical uh, model framework. Okay. So <clears throat> the basic thing here isn't to say that necessarily something is wrong, but it is to say that your structure is therefore sensitive to your time slice width. So if your time slice width truly is something that's you know, inherent in your process, then fine, that's great. You have a process that naturally has a rate to it. But if you have a process that does not naturally have some global rate to it, then your, um, your, your structure you've estimated is not some inherent property. So those are two theoretical reasons maybe not to like a discrete time model or to be uh, somewhat concerned about it. Empirically, these are also true. And if you talk to practitioners, they kind of know this. Excuse me. So here's the simplest example. I have a process of four variables. Okay? The first variable is a Markov process that proceeds as it wants at a rate of approximately one. The next process tries to follow the one above it. The third process tries to follow the second one. And the fourth one tries to follow the third one. That is, um, if they disagree with their parent, they switch relatively quickly. And otherwise, they tend not to switch. Okay. Now I'm going to sample a bunch of trajectories from those, and then I'm going to try to learn back the network structure. And I'll use a DBN. So here I'm increasing the number of samples I have, and here I'm um, increasing the, the sample width. I'm decreasing the, 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 my um, rate of sampling. Okay. And you get, obviously, a slightly different structure back every time, but these are pretty indicative structures of the ones you get back. So if I have a lot of samples in a very long width compared to the actual sort of natural rate of the process, I basically learn back a stationary distribution for this process. Um, right, this one's very good here. If I have a very fine width and I, and I have a lot of data, then I basically learn back the correct structure. And in between, I learn back all sorts of crazy things. But more importantly is this plot. So let's take each of those ones learned. Let's run this experiment a few hundred times um, and compare the model I get back, how well it predicts future data. In some sense, a proxy for the uh, Kale divergence to the, to the uh, true distribution. So up on top is if I use the correct model. Okay. <clears throat> and this is if I use a very finely fine uh, time model. And this is a, well, let's see, this is sort of the one that's at the natural rate. And this is a very uh, coarse green uh, time model. And the thing to be interesting here is the correct time slice to select depends on how much data you have. Yes, that's a problem if you're going to go about, if you're going to pick something. Yes, that, that's, that's, uh, that's inconvenient and annoying. Right? So, so in this data regime, you do better here. So what I'm going to show you is a, is, a, is a method that produces this. 
Okay, now sometimes it's a little cheating. Um, the model room produces exactly the one from which this data came. Okay, so it's not surprising it can do well, but right, very tight error bounds and, and, um, and beats them all. Okay. All right, so what's the alternative? Just to give some background, I think people are more familiar with discrete time models than continuous time models. Um, what's the background? So uh, here's, a, here's this a stochastic matrix here. Um, there are a couple ways of interpreting the stochastic matrix. Um, let's take a particular row here, right, the L sum to 1. Um, one view is that after a time, if I'm in state 1, what this row means is that after one time step, there's an 80% chance I'll be in the same state and a 10% chance I'll be in state, I guess I've labeled from 0. 10% chance I'll be in state 1 and a 10% chance I'll be in state 2. Okay. The other way of viewing this is that in terms of dwell times. So in that I stay in state 0 for a geometrically distributed number of time steps. Okay. Um, and then afterwards, I switch to one of these two states up um, proportional to the, to the, uh, the element in that matrix. Okay. That's, that, it's, it's an equivalent view of the same thing. So the alternative in continuous time system is to describe a rate matrix, an intensity matrix, or sometimes a Q matrix, depending on what you like. Um, this is a matrix in which uh, all run, rows sum to 0. The diagonal elements are non-positive, and the off-diagonal elements are non-negative. We have a similar interpretation. There's one row per state. This row here describes what happens if I'm currently in state 0. Um, and the two views are, are somewhat similar. <clears throat> so this row here means that after an infinitesimally small period of time, that is, as epsilon goes to 0, okay, this is the limit, is that the probability I stay in the same state over that period of time is 1 minus uh, this quantity here times epsilon. And the probability I move here is this times epsilon. The probability I move here is this times epsilon. Okay, that's the infinitesimal generator. Um, alternatively, I can view this in terms of dwell times. Okay. So this states that I stay in state 0 as an exponential, the continuous version of a geometric, with um, rate 0.24. And that once I leave, of course, I can't come back to the same state. Otherwise, it means I didn't leave. I leave. Um, I go to this state proportional to this amount and this state proportional to this amount. So again, there's an even chance of my going to the two. Yeah? In the first uh, view that you had there, mm -hmm. if I set epsilon to be 10, then I get a, pro a negative probability. Yeah, so it's, this is only valid as epsilon goes to 0. Oh, so, so this should be looked at as the limit. Yeah, it's the limit. Sorry, I didn't make that more clear. Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. It, it, yes, that's right, it's the limit. Mm -hmm. OK, so now how do you use this sort of thing? Um, a standard question to ask of this matrix is to marginalize out or push time forward. So I have a marginal distribution represented as a row vector over time 0. And now to push forward, I essentially do a matrix multiplication. That gives me the marginal distribution at time 1. Okay. Um, if I want the marginal distribution at time 2, I essentially I do the same thing again, which amounts to multiplying by t squared, et cetera. Okay. So down here, the equivalent question is, and now I'm using this notation to note that the argument is a possibly real valued number. So I have a row vector here that represents the distribution at time 0. Um, to push forward to time t, I use the matrix exponential. So you can do that sort of equivalent to this. So I use the matrix exponential there. Um, matrix exponential, of course, is uh, this Taylor expansion there, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, or alternatively, it's the solution to uh, this, part, uh, this ordinary uh, homogeneous differential equation. Okay. So sort of the most straightforward differential equation you can answer ask. OK, so the first question you usually get is, well, that seems a lot harder. right? Differential equations compared to matrix multiplication, that doesn't seem to be any better. <clears throat> so what, well, so I have a three-state system. So essentially, to solve this differential equation, I'm trying to integrate this. So this is just the derivative of that um, right? over time. So I have a distribution here at time 0, and I'm trying to get a distribution, let's say, at time 8. But actually, computationally, not, not to write the algorithm, but to have the computer actually run the algorithm, this can be a lot simpler. Why? Because I'm not going to do this integration by just sort of some standard you know, Euler integration. I'm going to do it by some adaptive integration method, in which I take an estimate of what the derivatives are here and what the curvatures are, and decide how far I can jump out. So in time periods when these distributions are changing drastically, I will spend a lot of computational time to estimate very carefully what goes on here. But in time periods where things are not changing very much, I will adapt my integration step size and take large jumps. 
And so computationally, I can get by with taking probably many fewer jumps to get the same accuracy over here than what if I just treated it as a discrete system and sampled it at some particular rate. Okay? I'll touch on that later. So, um, so these are, you know, like Runga kind of, Runga kata Felberg methods, right? Or these, these sort of adaptive integration methods where you take a bunch of derivatives near your point, you see how far and how fast you can go um, without increasing your error by too much, and then you take adaptive uh, step sizes. Okay, <clears throat> so, all right. So what we want to do is actually build uh, models like this that are for uh, systems that are described in terms of variables, not in terms of a flat state space like I was doing before. So um, just to sort of set um, a little bit of what we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to talk about a factored model. Uh, I'm going to talk about continuous time Bayesian networks, which is the factored model that we developed. Um, there are some others from the verification literature, um, Petri nets and things like this. They tend to be very focused on steady state distribution properties and not on learnability estimation from data. Um, so I don't want to give you the impression that this hasn't worked on before, but that, that's sort of the work I'm, I'm kind of ignoring here. Sorry. Um, so. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to describe a distribution over trajectories. A trajectory would look like this. If I have three variables, it would say the variables start at this particular moment, and then asynchronously at various real valued times, um, they switch. So it switches from light green to dark green here, and then shortly after when this switches from orange to red, and then here this one switches from dark blue to light blue, etc. So I'm trying to describe a distribution over this. A particular sample trajectory can be described by a finite but unbounded number of switches and the times at which those switches happen, those are real value times, and the, the state after the switch. The evidence I might care about might look something like this. Um, this is the same trajectory. I've just removed parts I didn't know about. So at various instants, I might know the value of certain variables just for an instant. We call that point evidence. Um, for other periods of time, I might know that it was green solidly from here to here and dark blue solidly from there to there. Um, that we call that interval evidence. Over some periods of interval, over some periods of interval evidence, I might actually observe transitions. So I know that a transition happened here. And here I know that no transition happened. There are other kinds of evidence you might have. You might know that between here and here, it only transitioned once, but you don't know exactly when, things like that. You can incorporate all those into this kind of evidence model. Discrete time model, you can do the same thing, right? Because um, it depends what you mean. Yeah, uh, but for factor model, you have done that, right? You, provide, you have to provide some constraint, otherwise, you know, different dimensions. Sure. So I mean, a DBN is an example of a factored discrete time model. Yes? And then, and then it actually can model the single, or maybe this. Uh, so, so yes. So right. So you certainly, uh, uh, you certainly are ma uh, modeling trajectories. Um, whether or not you view that you've captured everything. So if I know it's light green here, and then at this point I know it's dark green, did I know it only transitioned once in between, or two, or three times in between? So a, a discrete time model does not tell you what happens between those time points. Yeah, but it's just a precision issue. Right? How precise you want to represent the transition? Correct. And so, and it's right. So the more precise you want to represent it, the more computational time you're going to take to propagate across a particular unit of time. If I want to use a delta t of you know 0 0.001, then to propagate across one time step, I have to propagate 100 times. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yep. Just show three, you know, like, uh, you mean three models. So this is the factored model you're talking about, right? Uh, I'm going to build a factored model. A factored model essentially means that the state at any time is an assignment to variables, right? And so I'm saying, as an example, in continuous time, what that would look like is not, not at this time I have this, and at this time I have this, and this time I have this, but continuously over time, a trajectory will look like this. So I'm trying to, OK. Did I get yeah, an answer? OK, good. good. <clears throat> so um, a CTBN is essentially built on the graphical model framework. Um, it's a graphical model. Each node is a process. Okay, not a random variable, but now a whole process. Um, a Markov, well, no, a, a, hmm, kind of a Markov process. Um, edges here represent instantaneous influence. So the simplest one I can give is this. So I have a process A and a process B. Process A proceeds without caring about anybody else, and a process B depends on process A. So what do I need? Um, process A is therefore a Markov process. I have to describe, in addition to its starting distribution, which I'm ignoring for this talk, I have to describe its rate matrix. So there's an example of a rate matrix not chosen arbitrarily. <coughs> um, and for process B, instant, I have two rate matrices. So at any given instant, its rates of changing are governed by the instantaneous at that point state that A is in. 
Okay, so if state A is in state 0, this is the transition rates for B. And if A is in state 1, these are the transition rates for B. Yeah? Just to make sure that I understand yeah, sure. the implementation. So you, don't, you didn't draw a, a self edge from A to A. So if right, so a self edge is always implied. Um, if, you, if the state of A does not depend on its state in the instant before, then I don't know what that means. Just but instant, a. literally instant by instant, right? Then I have an uncountably. So, 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 so right. So, so I'm in the discrete time equivalent of true white noise, right? Which has infinite power, and so yeah. So I, I don't mean that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so self uh, edges are implied. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. you, you think of any variable that has sort of some meaning as having a some continuity to it, even in, in a very, you know, instantaneous. Uh, very small interval. That's right. Okay. Good. Represent a process. That's right. This node is a, this node is the whole process. That's right. Continuous time Markov process. That's right. And so the whole thing together also represents a continuous time Markov process over the joint uh, space of those two. So that would be kind of switching continuous time. Uh, in some sense, yes. The, the 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 rates of these switch based on this one here. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, right, so this whole thing here describes a joint Markov process over the state space of A and B. And just to give you some idea of what the semantics look like, that means that I should be able to build a rate matrix over the joint assignments. So A0 and B0, A1, B0, et cetera. And I can do that for a fairly straightforward way. Um, first of all, um, no two variables are allowed to change at exactly the same instant. This is pretty common if you think of it, two events can't happen at exactly the same time. They can happen arbitrarily close to the other at exactly the same time. So uh, in this particular simple example, that's the anti-diagonal. But in general, there are more zeros than that. So um, any case where this assignment and that assignment disagree by more than one variable, the rate is 0. <clears throat> if they disagree on A, then I just look up. So you know, this is the rate of transitioning from A is 0 to A is 1. So that goes here, because this differs just A's changes. This differs just A's changes. Et cetera. And then, for instance, um, when A is 0 and B changes, I can look up those from the green matrix. And when A is 1 and B changes, I can look up those from the blue matrix. And in that sense, I fill in everything except for the diagonal. And the diagonal I fill in just to make sure that the rows sum to 0. Okay, so that's, in some sense, my semantic meaning behind this. It's one way of viewing the semantic meaning. Now, I don't want to construct this matrix in general because it's exponentially large in terms of the number of variables. But you, know, you can at least theoretically think about having constructed it. So for that specific example, uh, is there any efficient algorithm that can detect the switching between A to B? What do you mean detect the switching? So, yeah, so, so I'm you're just. Running, you're running process in A and running process in B. Right? So you don't know. I mean, in your observation. You right, so we can talk, well, I haven't talked yet about what you do with it. I'm just talking about a, a, a formal. A formal a formal definition of a, of a joint process, then we can talk about what sort of questions you might want to ask of the process in a bit. So this is the general equation. It essentially says the same thing. If the two of these are joint assignment, if the two joint assignments differ by only one variable, then you just read it off from the relevant local uh, rate matrix for that. The diagonals happen to be these particular sums, and everything else is 0. Okay. So I want to point something out here. If you have n binary variables, this joint matrix has 2 to the n rows and columns. Okay. Each row has order n non-zero elements. So my original description is more compact than, a, than your standard sparse matrix representation. A sparse matrix representation you know, contains at least one bit of information for every row. Right? Okay. And I, I, I have sort of a, this description here um, has sort of a polynomial number of, uh, variab of, of information per variable. Okay, it's exponential in the n degree of the graph, but it's polynomial in the number of nodes in the degree of the graph, just like a standard bin, uh, Bayesian network. Okay. Right, so here's a, a classic example from our first paper. Um, it's uh, purely synthetic <laughs> generated, but um, cycles are okay, right? So whether or not I'm eating affects whether or not my stomach's full, which affects whether or not I'm hungry, which affects whether or not I'm eating. That's okay, All right? Um, so edges here have a causal interpretation. Um, you can, we can argue over exactly what form of causality it is. It's certainly Granger causality, whether or not it's a stronger notion of causality. Um, well, we can argue about that offline. So um, deseparation still holds like in Bayesian networks. So a variable is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. Okay? Um, and the similar notion of a Markov blanket exists. So you're independent of everything else given your parents, your children, and your children's parents. 
thing you have to remember is that your children and your parents may be the same people because you have cycles in the graph. Okay, but if that worried you about notation and graph theory, then the other sorts of things that should be worrying you a lot more. Okay. Um, uh, but the notion of given means the entire trajectory. So um, how does this work? So concentration is independent of hungry given full stomach. Okay, but it's asking me I know the entire trajectory from zero to whatever time point I care about of full stomach. If I only observe parts of it, that's not true. Okay, and this is a little like in a hidden Markov model. Um, uh, well, it's harder to say in a hidden Markov model. Okay, so it's harder to say in a hidden Markov model. You just have to observe the whole thing. That's what I can say. Otherwise, you, you, you don't have a full observation of this variable. Okay, the other important part here is that marginalization does not produce a Markov process. So um, uptake is a Markov process, right? It doesn't, it doesn't pay anything else. If I marginalize it out and try to incorporate it into concentration, the result is not a, mar is not a Markov process. This is like I have, have a hidden, in discrete time, I have a hidden, hidden Markov model. I have the x states and the y's that come off of it. If I try to marginalize out the x's, the distribution over the y's is not a Markovian process. That's the whole purpose of having a hidden Markov model. Right? Okay. So the same thing's true here. If I marginalize out this variable, the description I'm left with here is not a Markov process anymore. Okay? In fact, if I marginalize everything out, I end up, uh, it, it, the, description, um, the size of the description grows exponentially. Okay. okay. Um, so this is a member of the exponential family, like all good distributions, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> the sufficient statistics are uh, for each variable, for each value its parents can take on, for each pair of values it can take on, xi and xi prime. It's the number of times in the trajectory it transitioned from x to xi while its parents had value pi, pai. And it's the amount of time that variable spent in this particular state while its parents were in that particular state. Those two things are sufficient statistics. And then you get um, this uh, linear form in terms of the sufficient statistics um, and, the, uh, and the parameters of the distribution. All right, so <clears throat> this is the sum of every variable of every instantiation to its parents, every instantiation to that variable, and every other instantiation to that variable. Xi, doesn't, xi prime does not equal xi. Oops, wrong button. OK. <clears throat> OK, so other questions as a machine learning person you might be interested in are? Um, how can you learn such a process? How can I estimate such parameters? So let's assume I give you the structure. I just want you to estimate the local rate matrices, the Q matrices. Um, for That's trivial. Uh, basically, you have a bunch of um, multinomial distribution, a bunch of exponential distributions, and you just go read off the parameters from the, from the sufficient statistics here. Okay. It's, um, it really is quite trivial. Okay. Um, so in that case, you have to know. When the switching occurs from that's right. one I'm saying, I'm saying, that's right. I'm saying, right. it depends. It depends. I'm saying, if you have a system in which you have complete data, that is, I observed all variables yeah, yeah. at all times, then this is trivial. Yeah, uh, I'll hidden, right? The example you give, all hidden. What the one you show, the hungry stuff. You know, the, the Maybe I don't know. I might, I might know those. I might not. I'll, I'll cover that section in a moment. So, um, the structure here is also particularly simple. So unlike a Bayesian network, in which learning structure is a somewhat difficult process, okay, it's not true for a CTPN because cycles are okay. The whole thing that makes a Bayesian network learning difficult is that you can't allow cycles. So therefore, you have to search among the set of acyclic graphs, which is not a nice set to search under. Okay, I don't have to search under that set here. So if I bound the end degree of my graph, then there's a polynomial time algorithm uh, for searching for the best graph, and I find the global maximum. Because I can consider each um, variables parent set independently and just optimize it independently. Okay. In fact, you could do that for Bayesian network too if you allowed cycles. Right. So for incomplete data, that is, there are at least some time points at which I didn't observe some variables. Right? There might be variables I never observed. There might be variables I didn't observe for particular periods of time. I might have only sampled it at some regular rate, but I want I didn't know what happened in between. Then to learn parameters, you need to use expectation maximization works. Essentially, I just have to estimate the expected sufficient statistics. Okay, and I'm back up there, and I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Um, and actually, the structure is not too bad. So structural EM works. I mean, structural EM works for Bayesian networks too. It's a little more of an art. Um, it's not so bad here, mainly because the structure search step is exact. I get to the global optimum, so I don't have to worry about um, as many things. I might be running off here, and then maybe I didn't find the global optimum and how do I trade off you know, iterations of the, of the structure search versus iterations of my E step and things like that. You don't have to worry about that as much. Not to say you couldn't worry about it, but you don't have to. 
OK. So how about for inference? So this is the task of I give a partial trajectory, and I want to infer what, in some sense, what happened when I wasn't looking, or where I wasn't looking. OK, so I think I mentioned before that marginalization produces non-Markovian processes. So you can't just do sort of a variable elimination style algorithm, because the, you know, the result of your, re your, your representation size will grow without bound as you do that. Okay. So, um, furthermore, um, if I'm trying to do filtering, I can't just push the distribution forward over time because as I push over any interval, suddenly all the variables become tied together, just like what happens with entanglement in a DBN. So actually, these things happen in discrete time models too, like in DBNs. It's just that they aren't as apparent. It looks, DBNs look like, oh, they're Bayesian networks and Bayesian networks are nice this way. <laughs> so they look a little bit better, but when you actually like, start working with DBNs, you find you have all these same problems again. So it's not like I've introduced new problems. I've just made them sort of more obvious from the beginning. OK, so you probably have a favorite approximate inference algorithm. Um, hopefully it's on this list. And somebody has done it for a continuous time Bayesian network. And uh, um, that's what I want to say. So expectation propagation, important sampling, particle filtering, Gibbs sampling, uh, general Markov chain Monte Carlo, mean field, uh, belief propagation recently, and then um, this one's a little bit special to uh, continuous time. Um, so I don't have time to cover all of those, and you don't have patience to listen to all of those, I assure you. I don't know if that makes inference any easier. The structure learning is simpler because of that, because I don't have to run the graph. But um, if I'm given a graph and the parameters, estimating what happened when I wasn't looking, it, I don't know if the cycles make things easier or worse. I don't, I don't think it changes it much. OK, so um, I want to get into a little bit behind this one and this one, because I think they show some interesting things about continuous time processes. And I'm going to show them at a bit of a high level. So one of them's mine and one of them's not. That makes me feel sort of more you know, egalitarian about this. OK. <clears throat> so um, filter, the first one is, is, is mine, and it's filtering. So um, I've now decided to turn the, uh, uh, the time axis on its head. Um, so here I have three variables. So what does filtering look like? Filtering is I want to maintain a distribution over the state of the system given everything I've seen thus far. So I start with some distribution over where I think the system started. I'll represent it like this. And then at some real value time later, I observe this state's blue and that state's red. So what do I do? I need to propagate this distribution forward. And then I need to condition it on the evidence. This is a standard uh, propagating forward. Uh, ooh, I do have animations. Who put that in there? OK, so then, um, then later I'll observe something else. I'll propagate that forward. And I'll condition that, and I'll continue on. OK, so I might have some other evidence. I'm, not, I'm only going to talk about point evidence. This works for non-point evidence, but let me just make a, let me just say it works, and we'll move on. So th there are a couple things to note here. The conditioning is standard distribution conditioning. You have some distribution, you just you know, don't allow it to be certain values, and you, you renormalize. <clears throat> this propagation is by the matrix exponential. Right? I represent, if I represent this as a joint vector, I'm just supposed to multiply it by the matrix exponential, and I'm good. So this is essentially the step I want to concentrate on. So um, I'm not going to calculate the matrix exponential directly. I'm going to instead calculate its pre-multiplication by a vector, because that's more numerically stable. Much like it's better not to take a matrix, a matrix inverse, but instead solve a uh, a linear system for the particular thing you're going to multiply your matrix inverse by. Okay, so the question is, how do you compute that? And Moeller and Van Loan have this great paper. It's called 19 Dubious Ways to Calculate the Matrix Exponential. And in fact, it was such a good paper that 25 years later they wrote, 19 Dubious Ways to Calculate the Matrix Exponential, revisited 25 years later. <clears throat> okay? um, if you're really interested, you should read it. It basically says there's no good way to calculate the matrix exponential. It's just not one of those computations that's uh, amenable. But, um, so the Taylor expansion is the most obvious thing, and it's unstable. Why is it unstable? The Q matrix um, is negative definite. Right? Negative diagonal elements should be reasonable. It's negative definite. So I have a Taylor expansion that alternates signs. And we know that you don't want to estimate a, something with a Taylor expansion that alternates signs. Okay. So I'm going to show you essentially how to use uniformization to solve that. Um, there are some other methods, Krylov subspace approximation and this integration, which, which we've played around with. But um, I'm going to build this off of the uh, Taylor expansion uniformization. So let me talk about that just quickly. I think this is interesting. So I'm going to take my continuous time system, and I'm going to convert it into a discrete time system. Okay, but there are a couple different discrete time systems you might be thinking of. I could be imagine I could 
choose to essentially discretize time at some rate and calculate the equivalent. OK, I'm not going to do that. The other is I could talk about the embedded Markov chain. That is, I don't care when things happen. I just care what sequence of events happened. I'm not going to do that one either. Okay? I'm going to build a different one. Um, so I'm going to let my Q matrix be equal to some scalar. Um, that doesn't look like the right equation. Yes, that's right. Some scalar times a stochastic matrix M minus the identity matrix. Or put differently, I'm going to build a stochastic matrix M by taking Q, dividing it by some scalar, and adding the identity matrix. And provided my scalar is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the biggest element in the matrix, the resulting M matrix is a stochastic matrix. It amounts to the system in which I sample times from an exponential distribution with rate parameter alpha. And then at each time, I sample the next state of the system from this stochastic matrix. So I can have self-transitions on that stochastic matrix because it might be that that wasn't enough time to actually get a, a generation of a next event. OK, I didn't come up with that. That's, been, that's old. So now if I have p to the eqt, that can be broken up like this. So in general, um, this is the sum of two matrices. In general, e to the a plus b is not e to the a times e to the b. Alas, they know life to be simple. But if they have the same eigenvector structure, then they are. And i has any eigenvectors you want. So, so these two do commute like that. Okay? So this is a scalar. This is, uh, this is a scalar. I'll just pre-compute that. Right? And then this here, I can do with the Taylor expansion on m. And now m is positive definite. And so this doesn't have alternating signs, and I'm OK. OK, so far so good. That's great. So the essential calculation then is I have the first element is p, the next element is p times m, the next element is p times m times m, and then p times m times m times m. So I essentially need to comp compute this. Now remember, I don't, m is big. m is you know, 2 to the n by 2 to the n, so I don't want to do that. So, um, and in fact, even if q has compact structure, m will have the same compact structure, but multiplying by it will destroy any structure that might have been in v. So you might have had some nice structure in V. If I multiply by M, it will essentially destroy that. Okay. So there are a number of things in the, in the uh, Markov chain literature um, that deal with using some sparse representation, which is great for tightly coupled systems. I want to use a factored representation, one more similar to, like, say, the BK algorithm from, ba um, from for Bayesian networks. Um, and that's good for sort of more loosely coupled systems. So let me show you basically what happens. Um, I have P. I want to compute. Uh, p times e to the qt. <clears throat> Here's an exact way of doing that. Well, if I have an infinite computation time, I take p, I multiply it by m, I multiply that by m, I multiply that by m, and then I sum all those guys up with the, so, the appropriate weights from my Taylor expansion. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. OK. So I'm not going to do that. Since I've been filtering for a while, I don't have an exact answer. So I'm going to start with some approximate answer here. Okay. I'm going to multiply that by m, but then the result is going to be too big to represent. So before I even compute the result, I'm going to project it back onto the space of distributions that are completely factored. Okay? And then I'm going to continue to use that. Multiply and project. Multiply that and project all the way down. And I'm going to sum all those up. Okay? And the question is, I started with something. This is what I wanted. This is what I started with. This is what I wanted to compute. This is what I actually computed. Can I say anything about how these two things relate to each other? Can I bound some sort of error here? And the error shows up in three cases. So there's some error that started off. I'm going to talk about the Kale divergence error, okay? because the Kale divergence error in expectation goes down as you condition on things, unlike the L2 or L1 error, because okay. so, I'm going to be conditioning. So there's some Kale divergence I started with here. This step is an approximation of that step. So I introduced some error there. I introduced that error multiple times. I sum up a bunch of these things, which also introduce some error. And then I didn't do this for an infinite amount of time, right? which I was supposed to do. Okay. <clears throat> um, the saving grace here is that M is a stochastic matrix. So with any stochastic system, over time it tends to couple. That is, it loses its memory. Right? Okay. So that means that as I multiply these things together, if I start with something that's approximate, then over time, actually, I'll end up sort of towards the same thing. If I let, it run, if I let a stochastic system run for a long time and it's an ergodic system, I'll end up in the stationary distribution. I've completely forgotten where I came from. Okay. So, so that means that if I pro propagate through m, 
there'll be some, that's supposed to be a subscript, there'll be some contraction rate by which this, the, my, my Kel divergence shrinks. And the projection error can be bounded by a constant. And so essentially the good news is that if I have a multiplication contraction rate and a constant error, right, a geometric series converges. OK. So the complete bound looks like this. That's lovely, isn't it? Yes. OK. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> I started off with, um, you don't want to see the proof? OK. So I started off with um, uh, KL divergence I began with. That contracts by some global contraction rate. No, this is gamma prime, not gamma. I'll explain that difference in a moment. Um, there's an additive factor here. And then this just comes out from the fact I truncated the Taylor expansion. This term in practice is very, very small, at least if you're willing to spend a little bit of time at it. So there are basically two questions here. Um, the first is, what's gamma prime? And why is it not gamma, the contraction rate for the whole thing? And the second is, why can't I just use the Boyan Kohler analysis for DBNs, which essentially does a similar thing? Um, and let me see if I can just quickly say what it is. Um, so the contraction rates, you can think of each local variable having its own contraction rate. So we're going to build off of that. And the reason I can't use a DBN thing directly is that when I do this uniformization, I don't end up with a DBN. I end up with a mixture of DBNs. And so Boyan Kohler doesn't exactly apply there. So one interesting thing is that the per step contraction rate scales as 1 over n with the number of variables. It's actually not good. But if I take the entire process of pushing this forward, the whole process contraction rate um, does not scale with the number of variables. It's constant. Okay. So, um, and, and you know, the details are in the paper. Okay. So let me talk about somebody else's work. Um, yeah, I'm good. So let me talk about somebody else's work. So, um, mean field is this other method, right, for producing approximate distribution in that uh, I sort of, um, I take this distribution, this is the distribution of all the processes, and I approximate it in a factored form. Okay, so it's the product over a set of local distributions. So in their work, they represent each of these Qs as an inhomogeneous Markov process. And so there are a number of different ways of parameterizing inhomogeneous Markov process. This is the one that works for them. Um, mu at a particular time is a vector. It's the marginal distribution at that time. Okay? And the other natural thing would be to have the local Q matrix at that time, which is a function of time. That's why it's inhomogeneous. But instead, what they do is something a little different. It's sort of like the density of transitions. And I'm not going to get into the details uh, exactly why, but it, it's certainly related to Q. OK. So the algorithm is you pick a bunch of Qs, you hold, you hold all the others constant, you pick one of them, and you try to maximize um, or minimize the Kell divergence between your approximation and the true distribution. Right? It's, this, it's, a, it's a variational approach. Okay, so, what, so then you work through a lot of math, and what do you get? You get that your new mu i, I'll just do the mu i's, I won't do the gammas. Your new mu i at a particular time is some function of the current mu i, your gammas that you've already computed, and then sort of the processes in your Markov blanket. Okay, so why is this good? This, this is a differential equation I have to solve, but that's good. Because again, I can use some sort of adaptive integration method here. Right? So I pull out you know, this particular process. And to go estimate its distribution, I do some adaptive integration. That means at certain times, I take large jumps. At other times, I, I work down small and, and be approximate. This also means that each variable has a different adaptive integration associated with it. So some variables I can reason about very quickly. Other variables I take time and carefully reason about them, which is good for most systems. You have some system, you know, I have the weather that evolves at a much slower time rate than you know, the traffic that I'm trying to estimate than the actual individual you know, vehicles on the road. OK. OK, so th this representation here ends up being naturally adaptive by variable by time, and so you're going to save computational effort. Now, I'm not saying you could not do this in a discrete time model, but I think it'd be much harder to try to figure out how to do it. It wouldn't be as natural to try to reason about, OK, I'm going to jump four time steps ahead or five time steps ahead. You don't, I mean, you could do it, but it's not as, it's not as natural. Certainly, you'd have to take integer um, jumps, integer value jumps. OK, so let me talk about two ways in which we've applied this. Um, the first is to uh, network monitoring. So I have a bunch of computers. They're hooked up to a network. Um, and what I want to do is I want to put something on the NIC here so that I analyze the packets that come in and out and tell you whether or not uh, you currently have some malicious thing running on your software, or some software running on your laptop. Okay. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to build a particular CTBN. I'm not learning this structure. I'm fixing it. Uh, essentially, I'm going to take the traffic, and I am going to separate it by uh, destination ports. We'll assume these are not servers. These are clients. So you know, uh, all my web traffic to 80, all my web traffic to, you know, uh, the, to uh, some other you know, alternate port, all my DNS traffic, et cetera, by ports. Uh, I think I'm going to pick out the top 10 ports or something, or nine ports and then one catch-all for everything else. Other than separating it by port, I am not going to care about anything except the exact timings. So I'm not looking at payloads other than to port numbers, destination port numbers. I'm going to build this as a plate model. So um, I assume that the traffic in general from your computer is generated from some hidden node that has four states. Okay? I'm not going to give any semantic meaning to those. Those are just states that can couple things over time. For each port, there are n ports for each port, there's a hidden variable that's dictating how that sort of traffic is being generated. Okay? And hanging off of that hidden variable, I have four variables, one to indicate packet came in, one to indicate a packet came out, one to indicate a connection was started, one to indicate a connection was stopped. So far so good. Okay. Here we refer to the precise time when packet is observed. That's correct. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so these are these are timing events here. Packets in, packets out, and the rest of it. Yep. Okay. So um, we looked around. We found two data sets. The Maui data set is um, some Pacific backbone data that comes from uh, Japan. Um, in this study, we assumed that we took the you see we took the ten most uh, active IPs. Um, we assume that. That's all the traffic that's being generated from that IP, which is clearly false for this data set. You know, I mean, anything that stayed within Japan, we didn't see. Anything that went to somewhere else in Asia, we probably didn't see. Um, LBNL has some enterprise traffic. I don't know what enterprise network it's from. It might be LBNL's network. They might have gotten it from someplace else. I can't remember. So we took that. That's, this is at the uh, routers inside the network. So this is probably a reasonable approximation of everything that happened for those hosts. We, I think, split the data 50-50. We trained on the data assuming it was clean. So as we built a model of what the normal traffic is that comes out of this computer, uh, we took the test set data. Um, at certain periods of time, we inserted uh, uh, worm traffic from, uh, from running a worm and gathering the traffic that comes off and inserting it in there. Now, these worms are pretty easy to find. They tend to just go and spam a bunch of packets. So we scaled them back down to 1% uh, or 0.1% of their natural running rate, so they blend into the background to make it a more difficult problem. Um, and then over a sliding window of 50 seconds, we calculate what's the probability under our model of that 50 second window of events condition everything seen thus far. Okay? And if that probability is too low, we say that's abnormal, that's strange, uh, something strange happened in this window. Okay. <clears throat> so here are, um, let's see, uh, there are ROC curves. So here are ROC curves. Um, these are the two data sets. Uh, these are three different uh, worms of, of various forms. Um, our line is the black line that's on top. I'm shocked. Okay, so, um, so that's our model. Um, notice the false positive rates here go from 0 to 0.1, and the true positives go from 0 to 1. Um, we compare it against a number of other uh, standard machine learning techniques. Um, this dashed green line, which you may or may not be able to see, is a nearest neighbor based on some features proposed in the um, network literature. Um, actually, this was a paper in the network literature. The one that actually beats us at one point is uh, connection counts. Just count the number of connections, and if it's too big, definitely something strange is happening. Um, let's see. This is a parsing density window estimator, sort of built on the same thing as the nearest neighbors. And the purple one is a SVM with a kernel designed for this sort of anomaly detection method. Okay. So there's an example of uh, using this to detect. Um, uh, network traffic. We've also used it to detect where, ne where it came from. So we took the same 10 hosts and then we took a 50 second window of traffic and asked it to say which under which host was this most probable. So imagine they all sit behind uh, uh, NAT, right? And, and we can fairly accurately describe which, which uh, host it came from. So you can do host identification too. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why you, for this specific uh, worm? On yeah, so why did the LBNL and the MyDoom worm? Yeah, we looked at it. It wasn't entirely clear to us. Um, I, I agree, that's strange. And um, we couldn't figure out why did we want to know? We want to know because then we could improve our method, right? <laughs> what is it? No, we don't know. It, it wasn't clear to us exactly what that combination was doing there because you notice that if you, you, change, if you unilaterally change either the two dimensions, you do fine. Um, it wasn't clear to us. Hey, there are millions of packets. I, we couldn't go look through them all, but. 
yeah, at least initially, we don't know. So, but in this kind of problem, if you use a discrete time with a very, very fine time discretization, do you approach something close to this? Sure. As time, as your, as your, so the CTBN is the limit of a DBN as the time width goes to zero. Okay, but it's computationally more efficient. That as time width goes to zero, your computational time also blows up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Step functions. Here? You mean like this? Yeah. So the answer is essentially that as you vary the threshold, you, you suddenly grab a bunch of you suddenly grab a bunch of the uh, a bunch of the traffic and that's all you can get. That makes sense? So so some of the time windows, the same threshold will instantly push you across them. I, I, that wasn't helpful. So, so the, the threshold is on the probability of that window, right? So, so it, it, certainly I drop the threshold, let's see, uh, over here the probability is really, really high, right? Uh, really, really low, sorry, the probability is really, really low. And as I increase that probability, it's one of the two. As I increase that probability, um, basically I move from here to here. There, there, aren't, any, there, aren't, sort of many, there aren't very many operating points in between. Uh, what kind of, for this particular task, for example, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of time discrimination that would give you comparable complexity? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we didn't do that. So one thing you'll notice is that you have to use an approximate inference method here. We're using a Rao Blackwise particle filter, actually. So I didn't tell you that's another one you can do, Rao Blackwise. But we're using Rao, and if I went off and implemented the same thing in a discrete time, y you could have distinct columns about how I chose to implement that particular one. So I don't know what the equivalent one. But one thing is, the rates here do change drastically across time, right? The computer's off, the rate of events happening is very, very slow. Then the computer comes on, your rate of events happening is very, very fast. So uh, you'd have to have a pretty small time wi window to capture a lot of the stuff that happens here. Because there are times when, you know, I'm really capturing every packet, whether or not they're only, you know, microseconds apart, or milliseconds at least apart. Um, and if I wanted to time slice it that width, this would be intractable in a DBN. Yeah. That condition, I mean, which you, you haven't, you haven't, you show, I mean, is the performance approaching this form? Yes, as I said, it, it certainly if I took the time slice width to go to zero, and I had that, I don't have that much computation time this year, but if I did, then I would get these results. So CTBN is truly the limit of a DBN as the time slice width goes to zero. The, the practical issue is that, I mean, it's very important to know whether the time really pays off. So yeah. under the comparable computational complexity. What well, I'm is saying is the, the only comparable time. one I have here is I time slice at the smallest event between two, the smallest time width between two events. So, okay, so, if, so I have events. If I have packet, a packet emission and another packet emission, if I want to capture them both in the DBN model, I have to sample at a rate that's that narrowest width. If I sample at that rate, there's no way I'm, I, I, I can compute this in, in, in a year or two. Yeah. Okay, so, so, I can, so I can do that. So I can try to aggregate. Then I have a DBN that's a little different, right? Then I'm saying it's Markovian in the number of samples that have happened between here and here. And then you have a different model than I have. Yeah, and so then I can't, if you're just talking about a comparison on computational point of view, I can't make a comparison there. Because, you know, you're saying it's Markovian in the number of samples that have happened in the past time with, and I'm saying it's Markovian, right, in, in this global state that went on. And so you really have a, a different kind of model. This is the hard part about like comparing the two is if I time slice it finely enough, I can't compute the, the DBN one. And if I don't, if I do something like that, now we have different sort of Markovian assumptions and yeah, yeah, we have we have other problems comparing. Yeah. So this is kind of, you know, uh, I was looking at some data from our networks that tend to have daily and weekly cycles. Yep, yep. So all of this was taken from one week. But the, so <laughs> Traffic at different times of the day might be very different. Yep. So how would you detect that? So that's why the hidden variable is here. So we don't we don't we don't automatically do anything about it. We're hoping the hidden variable captures that kind of semantic meaning. That is, from the past window, I'm going to have my current state have some estimate of let's say g that captures the fact that it's currently you know Monday afternoon and things are different Monday afternoon. Enough to capture force, I'll say, yeah, four states were enough, and it was also enough that we could do the computations. So it was this balance between expressibility and computational power. Yeah. Now, again, this was, this was traffic across, I think, it, 
I think it was a week. It might have even been shorter than that. Okay. Um, so I, I don't want to claim some broad thing about, yeah, this would work you know, across months or something like that. Yeah. Yep. This was also done about four years ago when our ability to do exact or approximate inference and exact inference wasn't as good. So I think we can, we can crank these numbers up now with, with better numeric uh, algorithms. Yeah. OK, uh, I already did that. OK, so the last one is uh, social networks. Okay. So um, a lot of people look at static social networks. In fact, a lot of really smart people are looking at static social networks. So I don't do that because I don't want to compete with really smart people. So uh, actually, there's some smart people looking at dynamic social networks too, but there's just fewer of them. So, um, so here's the idea is that I'm monitoring the communications, let's say, in a social network. Either I, I see people's emails, or I see people's phone calls, or I see people's Facebook postings, or whatever it is. Okay, it depends on you know, what institution you live in, which is a reasonable uh, model. And what I want to do is I want to estimate this, the changing underlying social network. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what we do is we basically build a generative model of the social network, um, of the actor's internal parameters. Um, and of the observed communication patterns. We take that model, we condition on the observed communications we actually saw, and we try to reason about what the social network might be. Okay? So we call this the hidden social network model. Um, it's built on some work in sociology. So sociology has been looking at social models for a long time. Um, and they even have continuous time Markov models of how social networks might change. We took the one from Schneider's. Um, it's the network attribute coevolution model. So it essentially says that the network evolves um, so links between two people change based on the attributes of those people. So if I smoke and you smoke, then chances are you know, we'll form a, a, there's, there's a higher chance we'll form a friendship than if not. Um, and my internal attributes, like whether or not I like football, might change based on whether or not my friends like football. Okay. okay. So the network attribute coevolution model broadly looks like this. There are two kinds of variables. Y, I, J is whether or not there's a directed link from I to J at a particular time. And zi is where the attribute of actor i at a given instant. Yep. So how, how do you uh, define in real network that there is indeed an uh, edge between i and j? So definitely, if you know, if we talk now, then yep. there is an edge. So, so I, so I'm going to define the model, but I'm not going to observe that variable. Does that make sense? So how would you verify it? Ah, uh, yeah. So I'll talk about the verification in a moment. It gets a little tricky. Yeah. Yes. In fact, I'd love to have a better data set in which to do it. But I'll show you what we can do. Yeah. Um, OK, so the model from Schneider's is best described as sort of a forward sampling model. Uh, every actor has a rate of change. When their rate comes up, you know, the, the event fires, they look at their current network and their current attribute, their local, like who they're friends with and their local attribute, and they consider any unilateral change. So I make or destroy one friendship, or I change my attribute by one value. OK? So each this is DDS number of, huh? of continuous time. DBS this is continuous time. So one person will be one number. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So, um, so I compute those utilities, some are bigger than others. I put them essentially into a Boltzmann distribution, so it's just basically a soft max. And I, I pick the one that's essentially, including the one I'm currently in, essentially soft max. So if I'm currently in a local minimum, or maximum, I guess, in this case, right? I tend not to move away from it, but I might. Hey, that, that's the model. And the only question is, what does this utility function look like? Um, and he essentially proposes it should be some linear function of some things. And the ones we use are popularity, number of mutual links, similarity of your attribute to your friends, stuff like that. OK? All right. <clears throat> so um, essentially, I have one variable for every possible link in this network. So there are n squared variables. OK, so recall I have, let's say I just have 10 actors. That's roughly 100 variables. They're all binary. That's a state space of 2 to the 100th. So I'm definitely not representing this thing exactly. All right. Um, and then to add communications, OK. So there's a, there's a CTBN that describes the relationship between these. It's kind of hard to describe. It essentially involves context sensitive independence. So I'm not going to describe it, but there, it essentially amounts to a CTBN, the, the, the social model I just described. So what I do is I add a communication variable here, and it's, it's tied only to these two. So this is the communication pattern between i and j. And it depends only instantaneously on whether or not i considers j to be a friend and whether or not j considers i to be a friend. 
And so this might be, you know, um, it might they might have a few states, like they're calling each other, they're not calling each other, send a text message, sends an email, you know, that sort of thing. So you have a number of states about what the communication is at any given instant. So these change fairly rapidly. These change certainly much less rapidly over time. All right. So here's the data set we used. Um, this is the reality mining data set. We actually used the first version of the data set. There's a, there's a second, more complete version out. Um, essentially, some people at MIT convinced a number of students to put on their mobile phone a little application that monitored uh, when they took particular, uh, who they called, when, and when they sent messages. Actually, monitored a bunch of other stuff too, but we're ignoring that part for this one. Uh, it was over the course of about a year. Uh, we chose everybody in there who essentially had a valid phone number. We don't know the phone numbers themselves, but the data was kind of inconsistent in some way, so we threw out anyone who was kind of inconsistent. We resulted with uh, 25 people from the Sloan Business School, uh, 54 people from the MIT Media Lab. This is not surprising. Those were the two groups involved with setting up the study. Yeah. Um, and then uh, 13 people who we don't know their affiliation because they were not enrolled in the study. So these are people who did not choose to be part of the study, but more than one person they knew chose to be part of the study and called them at some point. Yes? Okay, this is important to understand, right? So nothing was running on their cell phone until it happened, but you know, some of their friends were blabbing about what, what they were doing. Okay. okay, so we only use the phone messages and text messages, the phone calls and text messages. So we learn a bunch of parameters. <coughs> um, so what we do, we take all that data. We only observe the communication patterns. We do EM to estimate the parameters. OK, and then I'm going to give you the parameters, and then we'll do something else with it. So the first is we get the network dynamics. This is from Schneider's model. We get the rate of changes. Um, everything here is in units of days. Well, this one is. These are just unitless numbers. Um, so this essentially states that um, you don't tend to make random friends. So all the things being equal, you're tending not to propose a friendship with someone random. This says that you really tend to propose friendships to people who are already friendships with, friends with you. Um, and that activity and popularity, which are sort of measures of the number of people uh, uh, connected to you who are connected to somebody else, are not as important. An interesting thing is we've tried this same model on other kinds of data sets. So there's one that has some panel data where they interviewed or surveyed a set of teenage girls, like early teenage girls in some school somewhere in Europe, I think it was Scotland, I can't remember where, and they asked them a number of attributes like uh, year one, year two, and year three, see how the friendships change. We actually get kind of similar um, numbers out here, oh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, but here the rate simply means the communication. No, 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 that's this. This is the rate at which you propose a change to your network. So that means on average uh, once every 40 days is what this is. So this part of Q, right? Uh, it's related to it. Uh, the, the relationship's a little complicated because it involves this. Then when you go to make a change, you then score any change you could make. I could drop you as a friend. I could add him as a friend. I, right, I could drop you as a friend, or I can add him, or add him, or add him. I, I consider a uni one, one unilateral change. I score them all, okay? And then I roughly pick the one that's max, that, that gives me the max score. And the question is, how do I score them? And the answer is, the resulting network I score according to its density, my local network density, the reciprocity, the activity, and the popularity, and I, I combine them with these linear weights. Okay, so this says I tend to prefer things that I have, I tend to, to move to networks that ha I have re reciprocity in. Okay. Now, the communication pattern, these are the rates for the communication patterns. So that, that's the rate for the underlying social network. Here's the rate for the communication patterns. So this is, so this is communication from K to L. This is whether or not neither of them consider each other friend. K doesn't consider L to be a friend, but L considers K to be a friend, the reverse, and they both consider each other to be a friend. Okay? Um, and so if we'll just take this line here, this essentially means that uh, the average time or an expectation, um, they tend to contact each other once every three to four days. 80% of those are phone calls, 20% are text messages. Um, this was you know, 2004, text messages weren't as popular then, I guess. Um, and the average conversation here, this is the end rate for a conversation. The average conversation ends in about five minutes. On average, right? Okay. Um, and you notice the rates here differ by huge numbers of orders of magnitude. I'm not going to be able to capture these things very well efficiently in, in, a, in, a, in a uniformly time slice model. Okay. So then, if we fix these parameters, we can go back and ask okay, what's our estimate, essentially a smooth estimate? I have all this observation. What's my estimate at this time step of what the social network looked like? Right? Okay. <clears throat> And so here's the estimate, for instance, at August 19th, and November 17th, actually at midnight, because it's a continuous time number, um, and you know, at February 15th. Um, 
And now here's when I'd love it if they had gone back and asked people what their friendships were so I could go validate it. And I don't have that information for this data set, and it's hard to find a data set that has good information like that. So all I can do is say, doesn't this look reasonable? And it's not a very, it's, yeah, it's not as convincing. I'll, I'll perfectly admit that, OK? So, uh, um, so one thing to note is that the algorithm did not know these groups. Okay, and we can see that we have a more dense, I mean, they were just all given a random ID, okay? So the algorithm tends to cluster, you know, the Sloan people know each other, the Media Lab people tend to know each other, and, you know, business school students are more social than Media Lab students. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, maybe, yeah, I'm, there's a selection bias there, right, okay. Uh, and furthermore, these 13 people who we don't know who they were, they seem to be more related to the Sloan business school students, right? Um, then immediately left students. But here's something interesting. I'm estimating social network connection. So well, this is a heat map. I should make this clear. White means we're pretty sure there's not a connection. There's probabilities, right? Black means we're pretty certain there is a connection. Uh, and you know, orange is reasonably sure, and yellow is not so sure, right? Okay. So I'm estimating here friendships among two people whom I've never observed the communication pattern between them because their phones were not monitored. I only observed when they called someone in this network. Furthermore, the people who were in this study came in and out of the study. It's not like I observed them continuously over an entire block of time. Someone performed a study here and dropped the study here. Um, I'd love to be able to verify these. So how do I do that at all? The, so it's not that I observed they didn't communicate to each other. It's, a, it's I didn't observe whether or not they communicated to each other. But I have certain notions of what social networks should look like in terms of reciprocity, in terms of you know, um, com communitivity and stuff like this of the social network. And that at least gives me an estimate here. Now, I don't know how accurate that estimate is. These are really hard. They didn't even agree to participate in the study. Right? I can't go track them back down. But I'd love to know whether or not you know, uh, that, because there's this one here that's solid. Yeah, Oops. Phone numbers, right? <laughs> no, no, I have anonymized versions of their phone numbers. Yeah, they got, they got, you know, they got hashed, they one way hashed onto some number. Yeah, call them up. Hi, back in 2000. Back in 2004, did you happen to know somebody with this phone number? Oops. Oh, no, that was terrible. Hang on. Let me, I'm essentially done here, so let me just go here. OK. So I'll give two plugs. One is uh, the code for um, almost all the CTBN algorithms I have available um, on a website. We're hoping to release a new version of it soon. That's, the current version that's there is not as numerically fast as we like. We completely under redid the whole matrix um, package with, uh, with Eigen, which is a pretty fast matrix package and it works much better. Um, I'm giving a, an UAI tutorial on continuous time processes along with uh, Gianfranco Chardo, who's a professor in verification, to give sort of the other side of this. These kinds of models have been used in verification, petri nets, so that sort of stuff at UAI. We'll sort of do a tag team kind of tutorial. You'll see some of the same slides, but not all of them um, at UAI. And the last thing is I've, I've tried to at least argue the case to avoid time slicing. There's certainly some cases where your data is naturally time sliced. So if you want to model the daily high temperatures, there's a natural time rate for that, right, day by day. In fact, it, it isn't a continuous sort of thing. OK. So, right, so, so there are certainly cases where you know, discrete time is the only way to go. But if the underlying process is continuous time, I think it's at least you should at least admit it. Just like you know, I'm going to go implement this algorithm in a computer, but I never less think I have infinite precision floating point numbers when I go to analyze the algorithm and develop it. <laughs> That's harder to say. Um, you notice I haven't covered a continuous state. Right, so this is a discrete state. So we've done some work on continuous state. Right, the, this is the, the Kalman filter as a continuous version. Right, and these sorts of things, they, stochastic differential equations. And, and you know, um, the, the classic option pricing is built on stochastic differential equations that do exactly this. They treat it as a continuous time process, yeah. I haven't done, I've only done discrete time. I mean, we can talk later about the continuous state one, but I, I you know, finite amount of time in the talk, yeah. You probably answered th throughout the talk, but I'm, That's okay. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm not very fluent in this stuff. So you've made a, a, a good case against, you know, sampling time because things have been rapidly and they date mm -hmm. for a while. So, but what's the objection to Thinking of a model where just every time an event occurs, that's that's my time. Oh, okay. So you're saying what I could do is I could build. It's called the um, the mar the the uh oh the underlying uh, um, build a Markov process that's on the um, the 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 skeleton the underlying Markov the underlying skeleton right. It just okay. 
you can do that. The question is you might care about the timings. I might care. So you say I go from state 1 to state 2 to state 1 to state 2 to state 1 to state 2. But I might care that when I'm in state 1, I, I stay there for you know, three times as long as when I stay there in state 2. You can't capture that in, in like, you know, maybe the value of the, the variable or the feature of your. Yeah, so you, you can. You can do that. Um, you don't end up with a Markov process. You end up with maybe a, uh, uh, a um, yeah, semi-Markov process or something else like this. I mean, one of, the, one of the large drawbacks behind Markov processes is discrete time or continuous time is that the dwell time in a state has to be either geometrically or exponentially distributed. Right? The geometric or exponential distribution is the only self-similar distribution. If I condition on having been in this distribution for this amount of time, the amount of time I remain is still the same distribution. Okay? That's, that's what it means to be Markovian. So if you want something that's, that is not that way, you have to move to at least a semi-Markov process. And we've done that a little bit. I haven't shown this here. We've done things where the rates vary uh, cyclically based on, say, the time of day. Those sorts of things. You can incorporate that in here to make sort of these semi-Markov processes. Um, but yeah, if all you care about is the sequence of events and not their timings, then that's right. Then you, have, then you definitely have a discrete time problem, and you, you should treat it as that. I'm not going to argue against that. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, or did I? Did I successfully skirt around your question? To... <laughs> I'm not trying to skirt around it. I just... Um... <clears throat> The other thing is, right, I may have observations. Here's the other way. I have observations that are tied to times, usually, right? I ask a sensor what its value is at a particular time. I don't ask it how many events have happened since the beginning of time so I know how to put you in a timeline, right? And so you're, you're talking about a model in which if I made observations of it, I need to know the number of events that have happened. Or is it more natural to know the amount of time that's happened? Maybe that's a, that's a, that's a different answer, I'll say, yeah. So how does all this? Uh, relate to this uh, uh, kind of point process. In some, in oh, so this is, I mean, you can build these things off of, uh, you know, Poisson point processes, right? Yeah. So the rate that you talk about is, <laughs> is, is, is directly related to, yeah, Poisson point rates. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions? Just the uh, of your state that you can have this successfully. Yeah. So how, how big can I build this up to? Uh, well, it depends. So the, the, um, the social network right, has a very large state space. Um, if you don't include the communication variables, you just include the, you just include the other ones, because communication variables I essentially always view, then I've got um, the state space is 2 to the 97 squared. 97 people? They're, OK, 97 squared minus 97, OK? Uh, you know, possible arcs, and 2 to that's the state space there. Okay. Um, that's big. I'd argue that's, that's, that's decent sized. Um, the, re, the, what, the what let us do that is we're doing sampling on this case, and there's a lot of internal structure, right? The, essentially, a few rates are, are governing a lot of what happens. I assume people are essentially homogeneous. Okay. Um, for things in which that's not the case, um, you can do exact inference. None of these things are exact inference. You can do exact inference for, oh, at least somewhere between 10 and 15 variables. Okay, and then how well you can do approximate inference after that sort of depends on how much time you're willing to throw at it, um, and what fidelity of your answer you need. So we can go up to you know somewhere between 10 and 100 variables easily, sort of depending on that. And then beyond that, you, you probably have to rely on something else currently. I'll say also that each year we get a little bit better about figuring out how to how to make our approximate methods a little bit better. So I wouldn't be surprised if you know in a couple of years I can come back and say we can do a thousand variables without a problem. But currently, that's probably not feasible for our software. The sampling ones are, you know, ridiculously easy to parallelize. Um, yeah, uh, some of it can be parallelized. Yes, so certainly the learning can all be easily parallelized. The that first one I showed you, where you're pushing forward and you're getting this approximation that's an approximate of something approximation. Um, that one, the matrix multiplications, you can do some parallelism on it. it. It's not as it's at a much finer grain and harder to do. Yeah, it would be it would be it would certainly be feasible. We haven't yet looked at that, but yeah. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>